Hey videographers, the script I wrote for this video was kind of edgy and aggressive, but there's nothing like getting out on the river to calm down, reset my thoughts, and contemplate my charmed life. The script talked about the misconceptions that I often see about using digital cameras to shoot video and pretend that it's film. So let's tune it down from my YouTube voice to a more relaxed Canadian tone. Now, from your comments, I understand that you want your projects, your films, to look cinematic. You want to emulate the looks you see in theatrical releases, and that is an entirely worthy goal. And it's totally possible to do that with a camera like this, even one that's less than this. But you think to be pro and create that kind of quality production, you've got to shoot 24 frames, 180 shutter, and use X-Log. <laughs> well, here's my slow boat reality check. Your work doesn't get film-like by worrying about frame rates, shutter settings, or by using your camera's log profiles. Those are not the essential elements that give a cinematic production its look. The look comes from extreme attention to how the scene is set, the shot is composed, and how elements of the scene are illuminated. And that professional cinema look requires lots of lights to make light and lots of flags to block the light. The technical crew on a film set is dedicated to that task. And that team is dedicated, is directed by the cinematographer. That's what they worry about. A technician handles the camera settings. Now, this camera, along with its peers, is a wonderful tool. The large sensor, the quality lenses, and the color profile capabilities make this inexpensive device the near equal of pro video equipment. And pros will probably use the settings you've been led to believe will make you look just like the movies. <laughs> but those settings will not bring you satisfaction. What you believe to be rules are technical limitations that led to standards and somehow became unquestionable laws. <laughs> However, not all of those limitations are valid today, and they may not be useful if you're shooting with a consumer camera and producing for YouTube or other online distribution. Even fewer will be valid a few years from now. So why do we shoot movies at 24 frames per second? Well, at some point, late in the last millennium, as filmmakers were trying out their new motion picture equipment, they tested and learned that for a projected image not to flicker, you needed to use a minimum of 24 frames per second. But there would not, well, there could not be an image on the screen at all times. The camera and the projector need time to physically move the film from one frame to the next. And during that time, the screen would be dark. A frame enters the gate, the shutter opens, the image is exposed in the camera or displayed in the projector, the shutter closes and remains closed while the camera or projector moves the next frame into place. I'm saying shutter, but it's not really a shutter as we know it in a stills camera. It's a revolving disc with an opening synchronized to hide the film while it's in motion. The disc revolves at the frame rate, 24 times per second, in both the camera and the projector. Now, luckily, thanks to a phenomenon called persistence of vision, we humans perceive images projected at 24 frames per second, if this, even if the screen is dark for half the time, as constant illumination. Uh, film was expensive to make and to process, and producers wanted to use as little as possible. At 24 frames per second, one minute takes about 40 meters of 35 millimeter film. So the absolute minimum, 24 frames per second, became the standard for motion pictures around the world. Cameras and projectors ran at 24 frames per second, and we just didn't see that the screen was black for about half the time. The faster might have been better, but it was too expensive. So now the good news. Those limitations are no longer valid in 2019. Digital cameras don't need any time to move film, and we can shoot at higher frame rates without additional cost. 60 frames per second, two and a half times faster, is not unusual. That's on the camera side. 
On the theatrical projection side, modern display technologies don't stay illuminated long enough. So they need to be flashed. That is, a new image needs to be sent more often. Modern cinema projectors may flash 48 or 72, some even 720 times per second, even if the image is the same for multiple flashes. Now, somewhere around 60 frames, we have to deal with the human perception of motion. Each single frame of a motion picture is a static image, and in order for an object to appear to be in motion, a hint of blurring is required, and filmmakers discovered that somewhat accidentally. Early film stocks were slow and required a lot of light to expose an image, so the chemical engineers wanted the shutter open as long as possible. While the mechanical engineers working on the film mechanism and the shutter tried to deal with physical limitations, they wanted lots of time to move the film. So how much time could be allocated for exposure and how much for the mechanical repositioning? Well, they agreed that each could have half the time, so the exposure time allowed was one half of 24th of a second, 1 48th, and shutter discs that were half open and half closed were created. Now, at the same time, the enormous and powerful lights required to properly illuminate slow film talk stocks were being engineered. So until faster films were made, 1 48th was the shutter speed. And as you have likely observed from shooting stills, a shutter speed of 1 48th second is slow, and objects in motion are likely to blur. Luckily, that motion blur is perceived as normal to objects in motion by human viewers. But later, when faster films were made, the rotating shutter disc was improved with an adjustable closure, which could reduce the shutter opening time to smaller fractions. And although they could, they didn't change it very much. The settings on the shutter disc were measured or set in degrees of a circle. 180 degrees is half the circle and equals a 1 48th shutter speed. Larger numbers would reduce shutter times. And more good news, most cameras are capable and allow a wide range of shutter speeds for video. Now, some don't allow a shutter speed slower than the frame rate, but others do for a really interesting blur effect. Now, most of us can't perceive a difference between about 1 40th and 1 100th of a second shutter speed. But faster than that, there's no blur. So motion starts to look stilted, jumpy, and unnatural, unless you're slowing it down for a slow motion scene. Now, no one anticipated that in 2019, a wide variety of frame rates and shutter speeds would be available. And they didn't anticipate that we would be watching on screens in our homes that update at multiples of 30 or 25. Those numbers are a result of the frame rate, or more accurately, the refresh rate used for television images. Before more sophisticated control circuits were available, engineers used the pulse of alternating current to regulate and synchronize the refresh rate. Now, in Europe, that was 50 hertz, in North America, 60, although in those days they were called cycles per second. It is difficult to upgrade a large base of aging practitioners, and those early terms and concepts continue to be observed long after they ceased being relevant. So what frame rate and shutter speed should you use when shooting with a hybrid digital camera in 2019? Well, I shoot at 30 frames per second because the majority of my viewers watch my videos on screens that update at a multiple of 30 frames per second. I've spent most of my life in North America, and that's a familiar experience for my eyes. If I produce my content at 24 frames, the sophisticated algorithms in those displays will repeat frames now and then to spread them out to 30, but likely you won't notice. Professional displays may detect the native frequency of an incoming signal and match that, but those are not the devices in our homes. Anyway, that's why I decided to use 30, but I admit that 24 frames retains a mystical importance and attraction. Even though much cinematic production has moved to video, 
24 remains the standard. Now, while you may not be able to detect or identify a 24, 30, or 60 frame refresh, you may have a preference, and this preference skews by age. If you are younger and spend time playing video games, you are likely to prefer a faster rate. And those producing cinematic content continue to prefer the cadence of 24 frames. It is a personal and aesthetic decision, but for me, it seems pretentious, particularly as my content won't end up in theaters. And if you're wondering why I don't use 60 frames, as most devices actually refresh at that rate, it's bandwidth. Now, this may not be an entirely sound rationale, but if a camera's 60 frame recordings are not double the data rate of 30, it seems to me that even with sophisticated compression techniques, it's increasing the compression per frame, so less data is available for each frame, reducing the quality. Now, let me let the air out of the log bubble. Again, it starts with limitations. Our display technologies can handle about eight stops of range, from the lightest to the darkest, and that limitation is designed into the devices and described in an international standard usually called Rec. 709. The standard, developed for HD displays, describes both the range of light and the gamut, or range, of color. Improvements in technology are increasing both, and the industry is now working towards a new standard, usually called Rec. 2020, for 4K and 8K displays. So if you are planning to buy a new video display, full support for Rec. 2020 remains elusive, although there are many proprietary and interim technologies with consumer-facing names like HDR10, Dolby Vision, and HLG, or Hybrid Log Gamma, which adapts to the capabilities of the display. Uh, sensors, like those in this camera, have similar limitations, and those limitations are not exceeded in most conditions, like those encountered in studios. Illuminated scenes rarely exceed eight stops. But when you step outside, particularly in bright sunlight, you may encounter much larger ranges, 12 to 14 stops. When shooting with film, it degrades in a graceful, analog way, so that a properly exposed image might be created under those situations, but digital sensors do not. And the artifacts from overexposed images can be harsh and undesirable. Now, to manage this problem, engineers created algorithms, enabling the processors to modify the standard linear output from the sensor to reduce the brightest and darkest areas of the image. And this curved logarithmic adjustment increases the overall range by mapping the eight stops to a smaller four or five stop range and adding stops above and below. The details of those curves are created by the camera manufacturers, and it's why Sony calls theirs S-Log, Fuji Films is F-Log, Nikon's N-Log. The change in response is visible on this reflective chart. I've adjusted the exposure so the black to white range goes from 0 to 100 units on a waveform display. When a log response curve is applied, there is no longer a true black or a true white, and the waveform is reduced to about 60%. That provides a few stops additional exposure latitude. I usually illustrate this using the DSC Lab Xyla chart. Sony's standard response settings provide 8 stops. Using S-Log2, that increases to 11 or 12 stops. That's fairly typical for log. And with log profiles, you may notice some degradation noise in the dark areas. But what's happened is that the 8-stop image is now 4 or 5 stops. The dynamic range in the midtones has been compressed. Of course, using a log response curve requires some adjustment, color grading, to create an image that's again compatible with our current displays. If you're using professional recording gear, it has the bandwidth bit depth, and color subsampling to create a great looking image even after all that post-production processing. Uh, for a consumer camera with an internal recording that has limited bandwidth, bit depth, and color sampling, not so much. 
and in this case you'll find it difficult to make significant adjustments. The log setting has compressed the dynamic range and there's no recovering that. Now, I'll take a step back and say if your shot has a wide dynamic range, for example, someone paddling a canoe on a sunny day, log could be your best option, although we didn't use it today. And if you don't have a wide dynamic range to start with, using log will reduce the quality of your image. Shooting with the log settings is not a magic bullet or a setting that automatically produces cinema-like recordings. You may get better results using an external recorder, which has a higher data rate. But only if the camera also outputs a signal with more bit depth and better chroma sampling. And also, if you use a log setting, please don't go spending money on lookup tables or LUTs, which I find a most unattractive acronym. Doing color grading is easy. I do it. You can do it. And it will unquestionably provide better results. As every grade is specific to an image. Some video editing software includes LUTs, and some manufacturers like Nikon and Fujifilm provide the camera-specific LUTs to convert their image. They can be a helpful starting point. Th that's my piece. And I'm sure that to many of you it sounds like heresy. However, even as an aging practitioner, from time to time I find it worthwhile to review my assumptions. And please don't change your settings just because I said so. Go over the manual or the manufacturer's site to review the details for your model. Shoot a few test shots and let me know what you decide. This has been lovely. Uh, thanks for coming along for the ride. I do enjoy interacting with my viewers, and I do read and reply to all civil comments and relevant questions. And if there's one favor I could ask, please subscribe.